Welcome to the Mike on Much Podcast. I am your host, Mike Veerman, and today is a special episode because instead of having Max, boring old Max, uh, we have a very dear friend of the podcast who helped us secure one of our very first guests ever in Tim McAuliffe, our good friend and uh, L.A. resident, Matt Unsworth. What's up, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I like how cool you're just like, what's up, dude? Uh, uh, how you been, man? Good, good. Yeah, uh, busy. You're in town. You're in Toronto. In Toronto, visiting all the people, family and friends. Yeah, we're here at 299 Queen Street right now. For people that don't know, uh, Matt Unsworth used to work with us. He's a television writer, director, producer, and he made the trip down to L.A., which is pretty inspiring. You know, you went down there, you're working at Fox, and now you're at Amazon, I believe. Yep, yep. So, so yeah, tell us, what's it like? How, how's it been? Uh, it's been pretty good. It took, like, a little while to get things going. Took yeah. a few steps back, a few ego hits after the first year. Oh, yeah? Uh, like, in what sense? Oh, I just was, like... You know, just doing whatever job came to me, like ADs and PM and PA. So it took a while to get, get going, and then I got my first job at FX. It's been pretty good, man. Four years. sally has been pretty good so far. Yeah, your wife is an actress. Yeah, my wife is an actress. You guys went down um, together? Yeah, the plan was uh, go down together. When, when I met her for the first time, she found out, the first day I met her, she found out I was American, and she said, oh, you're American, can you marry me so I can move down to the States? <laughs> so full long con. Yeah, she's, uh, she she's committed, stuck. though. Yeah, she committed to it. To the long con. You, yeah. you won her over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She accidentally fell in love with you. It started out as a scam. She thought it was going to be a scam. Yeah. But then I scammed her. <laughs> um, you live in Hollywood. Yeah. And for our listeners, you've been the kindest ever. Greg and I were down there, actually, when the Arkells were recording, not this record, but the last record. You just let us, like, sleep at your place for a week. Like, you... Oh, it was the best. Having whenever you guys come out, when you come out or Max <laughs> comes out. Um, it's, it's awesome. I love having you guys out. And I just try and every time someone comes out, I'm like, Hey guys, look at the city. It's really fun. You should, you should maybe like think about moving here somehow so that <laughs> we can transport all the dudes out here. You want to get um, all the Toronto people down yeah. to LA. I, I'd go. I just need to marry an American. That's the yeah. play. You know? Yeah. You kind of blew it there. Yeah. It's hard to get a, uh, a work visa. Yeah. No, they're not screwing around there. And then you said like the competition's pretty fierce out there. So like you live sort of right in Hollywood and it's like, do you feel like everybody there is in that industry and everybody's writing and everyone's producing and everybody's with, it, working in television or movies? Yeah, it's kind of funny because it's like, I mean, like where we grew up, everyone worked at Stelco and DeFasco. Yeah, and we're both families. From, we're both from Hamilton for our listeners, born um, and raised. Yeah, and so like, you know, people's families and grandparents, like they all worked in, uh, at those steel mills. Absolutely. So it's kind of the same thing. Instead of a steel mill, it's the studios, but like every single person kind of lives off of it. It's like a, you know, it's like instead of a steel town, it's like a, I guess, a movie town or whatever. And right. everyone is employed in different facets. So when you're at the bar or whatever and you're talking to people and they're like, uh, you ask them what they do and they're like, oh, I'm a real estate agent. And you're like, what? You mean like for a reality <laughs> show? Like, <laughs> That's so weird, you know. Like everyone, finding locations. Yeah, yeah, for like yeah, yeah, yeah. Reality so just for movies. Um, so, but yeah, it's cool if you're into. I mean, if you're really into movies and and film and TV and stuff, like you can just that's you're just at the bar nonstop talking about all that stuff and yeah. like everything is like talking about the industry and and uh, you know most people that moved out there. They were the kid that was like, I want to make movies. I want to be in Spielberg or a Tom Cruise or whatever. So everyone's kind of come out and everyone's like really passionate about it. Um, so, I mean, for that, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool for sure. I think that if you weren't into film, you'd probably be – You'd probably be pretty tired of hearing about that stuff. <laughs> right. But everybody's like-minded, so you're all going to have those same conversations. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, – I got mentors. You want mentors? Oh, look at that. It's like, yeah, they're so, not even, we're really close. We're very close so. right now. Yeah, I, we've talked about this before in the pod, but we're recording this at 299 in, in what is a VO booth for normally one person. And later on in the dessert, we're actually going to pull Shane in here. So That's we're going to be a three-man pod in this little booth. Thanks for the mentos. We no should problem. get them to sponsor. Um, maker. You've worked with Shane and I for a long time before you moved down there, and we've been friends forever. Who do you miss more up here in Toronto, me or Shane? <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, does Shane listen to a lot of the episodes? He or? never listens okay, to the opening. Yeah, he only listens to the episode. <laughs> um, do you have any uh, stories anecdotally? I remember you told me a bit ago about um, getting to pitch Judd Apatow. Yeah. So they have this – It's there's like a cool thing, especially because, you know, have all these like celebrities are there and, you know, they probably get bored and like to do extra stuff. So you get these kind of chances where there will be some night where, you know, at the Largo and – 
Judd Apatow will do like some kind of show and like Sam, like M. Sandler will show up or there'll be a podcast. And, you know, I went to a podcast for um, the uh, community guy. Harmontown. Uh, Harmontown podcast. And then like Bobcat and Robin Williams just showed up. Randomly. Randomly. Weren't announced. So Ner- you're weren't announced. There. Just sitting there like, you know, watching them play Dungeons and Dragons and those two huge. Yeah, you know, I guess they're like really, well, they were really good friends. Um, so stuff like that happens, which is really cool. Like you have ex- like access to stuff like that. So um, a while ago, there was this night at UCB, uh, Upright Citizens Brigade. Uh, there's one in, there's two of them, but this one is in um, Beachwood. And it was, uh, it's a night where it's Q&A with Judd Apatow. So <laughs> Judd Apatow just sit, it's like a small theater and Judd Apatow kind of is just standing there and there's no formula to it. It's just, you ask questions to Judd and he's just on stage. It's five bucks a person. There's, you know, maybe a hundred people in there. He's just doing it. He just does it kind of for fun, obviously. Wow. And it's like, you know, when would you ever get a chance to do that? So you're sitting in the crowd and, um, you could just be like, tell me about that part in Freaks and Geeks or blah, blah, blah. And just, just people just asking random questions. He's just taking it. He's just doing a Q&A. Just Q&A. Just sitting there and you could just throw out a question. He answers it. And so it's not super easy to get tickets, but I schemed a pair. And so I was waiting and in the Q&A and I heard that the last time Judd Apatow um, let people go up on stage and pitch a movie. <laughs> so I was like just biding my time. This is my shot. This is my shot. And uh, he's like, all right, so, you know, this is the time, I, you know, we get people to come down and pitch me movies. And I was already standing up before he had even asked for volunteers. <laughs> and he's like, all right, get down here. So he brought me down. And, um, you know, he, um, so I have this movie I've been writing for a while. And uh, it's already done. I'm kind of like shopping it around. It's been registered at the... Uh, Writers Guild, just in case anyone wants to steal the idea. When I tell, I don't, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm way ahead of you. Don't even try. You know. Yeah. Okay. Dude, if, if you only feel comfortable sharing the plot right now. Yeah. I think I think I'm okay. Okay. With sharing the plot. It's registered people. So it's no registered. Steals. Yeah. Don't even try. Um, so I had it in the bag, and so I get down there, and he gets two other people, and they get on stage, and uh, Judd's like, "It's got to warn everybody. Um, you get these people down here." And uh, they look like normal people, and they you know pitch some super f- up script. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, f- yeah. And uh, and so yeah, everyone's laughing, and then he's like, "All right, uh, since you're the you, super eager one, goes to me right right away." He's like, "Tell me your your movie," and I was like, "Well, it's about uh, sex robots in the future." <laughs> and all of a sudden, he just like bursts out laughing, <laughs> and he's like, "This is exactly what I mean." He's like. Look at this guy. Clean cut dude. <laughs> Pitches some space porno to me. <laughs> and he just starts railing into me for like 10 minutes. Like everyone's just like laughing as he's just making fun of me. Like, And in my head, I, you know, going in, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll pitch this script to him. He'll be like, oh, let's make it. I'm, all right, you know, I'm super famous. This is awesome. You saw your whole future yeah, laid saw out. Saw my whole future. This is my plan. <laughs> but that cut to me just getting berated by him in front of everyone. <laughs> Everyone's laughing their ass off. And um, and then he's like, uh, so he goes, all right, man, give me, you know, give me more. What? Give me the rest of the the, the pitch. And I was like, uh, you know, men and women are segregated in segregated societies. Women with their robots. Men with their robots. And uh, there are female robots, and then all of a sudden one day, all the female robots blow up, and so these guys who've never talked to real women have to like go in and talk to uh, real women again, which they again, haven't done in which, centuries. You know, already. it hasn't happened in centuries, right? And uh, that was kind of the setup, <laughs> and so he starts making fun of me again for a little bit, <laughs> and then his agent stands up, and she's like, uh, um, she goes. Well, you know, Judd, you might want to take it easy on him. Ben Stiller is uh, selling, uh, pitching a sex robot script as we speak. And Judd's Whoa. like, and he's like, oh, well, I guess if Ben Stiller thinks it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, Were you crushed a little bit that Ben Stiller was pitching a similar concept? I was a little bit nervous, for sure. Um, but I was also sort of vindicated by his manager. And so uh, finally... The last step was he was like, all right, who are you going to – he's like, all right, hot shot, who are you going to cast in this movie? And I was like, Hannibal Burris, Danny McBride, and uh, Seth Rogen. And uh, 
And then he's like, yeah, that's a pretty good cast. And then his manager stands up again. And she was like, yeah, Danny McBride's actually attached to that movie. So <laughs> The Ben Stiller movie. Yeah, the Ben Stiller movie. <laughs> that's hilarious. Like, oh, I guess I don't know anything about Hollywood. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, just uh, yeah, so when, just took me down. Yeah. So when are you and Judd making the movie? Um, probably never. <laughs> I've been waiting for him to call me back. It's registered, though, so you yeah. never know. Yeah, you know, maybe he'll, maybe he'll uh, come to his senses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's, I mean, that's a really good metaphor for Hollywood. You go with these big, big expectations, you're going to be famous, and then it, it all just gets shattered in front of your eyes. <laughs> so that's an inspiring thought yeah, for all yeah, of our for listeners. Yeah, for anyone who's thinking about moving there. Um, going back a little bit, uh, maybe for any of our listeners, because, you know, again, you're a Hamilton guy, and you managed to get a job producing television at Much Music a while ago. How did you make that happen? Um, as a young man, just trying to break into the industry. Yeah, I was, um, it was actually pretty lucky. I had, uh, I was just living in Hamilton shooting wedding videos, Mm -hmm. mostly. That's how I paid the rent. And then, um, I would follow on the weekends, just follow some people in band, like friends who were in bands. Um, when Burlington's Boys Night Out was a big one. That they we were know, a huge band. At yeah, the time, they were yeah. those awesome dudes. So, you know, they let us, let me follow them around. We, my friend and I did like a documentary about them. And then, um... Uh, a mutual friend, this girl used to be a producer here, so I kind of picked her brain, spent a long time with her and someone else, like working on a resume and took it very seriously. And, uh, and were you doing like the thing where it's like, oh, can we go for a coffee and I can pick your yeah, brain? Yeah, it was totally like yeah. I did barely kind of knew her, and I was like, <laughs> I, I, I sort of knew her, but I was like, let me go to coffee, let me pick your brain. And it must have been so annoying. I mean, I'm sure we've all had that before. Um, but uh, she like helped me with my resume. She apparently pulled my resume out of the garbage at one point when John Campillis <laughs> <laughs> threw it Chucked in the garbage. It. <laughs> Chucked it right away. <laughs> so I owe her a lot for sure. So completely, get- completely unqualified, went in there. Uh, I decided to self tan to give myself a little color before the show. <laughs> like before I'm, the interview? Yeah, yeah. I give myself color. It was winter, but the bulbs were new, which is a thing, I guess. Oh my God. Totally lobstered myself. <laughs> so I looked like such an idiot. I had very little TV experience, and uh, Johnny K saw this, saw my resume, and he hired me. Well, I think like one of the coolest things is like what you just said is it's like so you work here for years, you win a bunch of awards, you establish like an awesome career, and then you decide to reset in LA, and you spent that whole year like grinding. Yeah, I think I mean that like you weren't too good to go back and do those things. Although I'm sure it sucked. Yeah, it kind of blew for sure. And I think I mean you're in the same boat. It's just like. In the TV thing world, it's like you just can't stop. You have to work twice as hard as the other person. You know, there's not really a thing where it's like you're going home from work and playing video games for four hours and going to sleep. It's just like work, 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 and kind of always picturing, you know, having an idea of where you want to go next. I think that's like, that's one of the very important things, you know, when preparation meets um, opportunity. And so... And much was like the best thing that ever happened to me. It was, you know, I got that job and probably similar to you. Like I got that job and I was like, just like looked at all the bullies and all the girls that broke up with me in Hamilton. And I was like, look at me now. Yeah. You As you I drive mean? out of town with yeah. your middle fingers up. Yeah. In, <laughs> in the go bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, no, it's true, man. It's like for us, like. Because much in Toronto seems so far away, I think, when you're yeah. younger and you're in Hamilton. You're like, how do you get into television? And then when it happens and, you know, you get lucky with your path and you catch a break. I don't know, man. It, it's the best feeling in the world. It's great. It just, yeah, it just seemed, especially from being Hamilton, it just seemed so un- unattainable. Yep. And it was just like, um, you know, you got to get your feet on the ground and you got to be there and kind of be in the scene. And then you kind of weasel your way in. And it was just like, but yeah, to like get there and finally um, have that job. It was amazing. And I like. You know, some of my greatest, like, best memories have been working at Much, for sure. Yeah. And when we worked together, we had such a awesome crew of guys that we're all, you know, obviously we're all still great buddies. We're all going out after this yeah, to get drunk together. Sure. Yeah. Um, it is. It was. Just, it's a special group. For sure. And it was like, yeah, it was just, like, so fun. to you going, to, going to work was, like, just, like, it was exciting. Yeah, it was almost sure. like, like college or something. Yeah, for sure. It Not was that like, I ever went to college. <laughs> But yeah, um, anyway, man, you're going to hang around for the dessert with Shane? Of course, for sure. All right, well, today on the show, I'm talking to 
a musician named Bishop Briggs. She has a song called River. It's, okay. Yeah, there's, you'd know the song if you heard it. It's like blowing up. She's very new, but she's led a really interesting life. She was born in the UK. She moved to Tokyo when she was like four. And then now she's based out of L.A. And this song, River, is like really big. It's really sort of soulful and, you know, hypnotic. And it's going to, it's like the song's already blowing up. It's going to blow up more. But she was really interesting to talk to for me because she's kind of at the start of her journey. Like, you know, she's gone to, you know, school for performing arts. You hear in the interview, like, all of the ways and all of the steps that she's tried to get to where she's at. Um, but it's just happening for her now. And, and sometimes I find it's really interesting to talk to somebody who's kind of at the very start, you know, for do, sure. doing their first press rounds and kind of are just really excited. Just because, yeah, like that potential, you know, you don't know where it's going to go. You it's don't just know. like, you know, could be, she could be massive, you know. 100%. That's super exciting. Yeah. And uh, so the interview, I actually really liked talking to her. I thought she was, she was really sort of um, introspective and was able to sort of frame where she's at and where she wants to H- go. How old is she? Do you know? I think she's 24. Okay. So one of the things that she was doing while she was here, so she was doing press and, and sort of talking about her album that's coming out down the road. And um, she was doing like sort of like a little kind of like for fans and industry people, a show at the Rivoli. You know the Rivoli. It's yeah, like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's pretty small, right? right? So it's like it was kind of really cool to see her in that environment with the band and uh, just see her perform. She, I think she did three songs and she was like, interview went really well. She was like, come check out the show. And I was like, oh, nice. it was like at three in the afternoon. So I was like, I'll pop over, <laughs> popped over, had a couple, you know, <laughs> vodka sodas and uh, settled in. I still came back to work. Don't tell my boss. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, she was, she was really good. So you want to get to that interview? Yeah, let's do it. You're filling in for the Max now. So yeah. You, yeah. 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 Did I live up to Max? Yeah. You were better. Okay, good. Yeah. That's Max all, is out. That's all I was going You're in, for. man. We're going to do remotes from LA. Sorry, Max. LA. <laughs> Sorry, bud. I'll call all right. in. All right. Let's get to Bishop Briggs. I kind of wanted to start uh, at the beginning because, you know, a lot has been made about your international background, you know what I mean? Sort of like living in Japan and Hong Kong. Like, what did your parents do? Or what well, do your parents do? Well, my dad was one of those people that was jack of all trades. And he just kind of had his hand in everything. I mean, he um, is a photographer, he writes, I mean, he does it all. And so I think sometimes... Like all creative, though? Yeah, a lot of creative. And I think sometimes when you... Um, have your hand in all of those different pots, you end up in a place like Japan, mm. you know? That's interesting. So was he able to work, like, sort of just plying his trade there? Or? Yeah. I mean, he's someone that is an entrepreneur. Like, the minute you meet him, uh, he's just super charismatic. I mean, I kind of think he's a spy, you know? <laughs> like, the more I talk about it, I'm like, is he a spy? Yeah. Like, what's going on? Um, but, yeah, he was a, yeah, that's how we ended up in those places, thanks to him. Yeah. Was he like doing a regular job there? Or was he always just sort of like doing these side gigs? Like how do, how do you make ends meet growing up in a place like that? Well, he made it happen. and <laughs> Don't ask too many questions. L- let's, let's keep it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he is a spy. Yeah. Um, so then you moved to L.A. Yes, I moved to L.A. Um, the day after I graduated high school okay. in Hong Kong. And what age is, is it like any different in Hong Kong, graduation age or it's anything like that? It's 18. 18, okay. Yeah. And was it the feeling sort of that you were waiting until you finished school to come back or was it always planned for that time to come back? Uh, well, I, it was my first time ever living in LA um, when I graduated high school, um, after I graduated high school. And so uh, super surreal to just make the leap and I had to do it. Was it a culture shock? Well, luckily a lot of people in Hong Kong, it's very similar to New York. Um, it's kind of this mecca of a ton of different people, a ton of different cultures. So I was quite adjusted. The only thing that I wasn't adjusted to in LA, oh, I, I mean, the whole buses thing was a whole new world. I mean, they have buses in Hong Kong, but LA is a whole other animal with like timing and uh, yeah, I had to make it happen. Just learn that system. You have to learn the bus system. The public transit yes. system. Yes, <laughs> That was the most challenging thing. <laughs> so when you get there, what, what do you do? Do you, do you have like a part-time job? Do you need to start like gigging? What, what's your plan as you get there? Well, um, I went to school first. I just did associate's degree. Um, At the Musicians Institute? Yes. How was that? It was great. I mean, it's, uh, I think it really helps when you are performing every day. Okay. And so after I graduated, I tried to do that. And every couple of days or every day, um, I would play a venue. Um, because it's the one thing in LA you can do for free, generally. Um, you can grab a ride from someone if you need to, but I didn't have the funds to record. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of the perfect outlet to practice my craft. Just gig. Yeah. 
is it sort of a traditional like do you have other students that you like study with or is it more independent I would say it's a mix it depends on which classes you're taking uh, but it's definitely all about your own journey and however you end up at the end is it like do you find it competitive with the other musicians or the people trying to write music I I never see it as competitive only because I really think you have to be competitive only with yourself mm -hmm. you know like this is a really tough industry and the minute you start going against the people that also have the same dreams as you I think is when a f you know you're hugely flawed and you're stumping your growth that's interesting so like as opposed to maybe looking at a peer and going like oh how come they have that and I don't it's more like an internalized sort of I need to just focus on what I'm doing and where I'm going yeah and do you find it difficult though to, to have the discipline and not look over there and go oh shit how come I don't have that honestly I, I'm someone that I have always been this way, um, but I think it's just because I, uh, maybe it's because I know how tough it can be that I, I know that we're all kind of struggling the same, whether it has a different filter on it or not is a whole other story. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so gigging, going to Musicians Institute, how did you divide time? Like, did you find that you sort of were just, I just want to create music and perform music all the time? Or were you like anybody else where it's like, oh, you know, shit, I'm 20, I want to go and have some fun with my friends. How did you split oh, wow. that time? Oh my gosh. I, I almost wish I was that 20s and just wanted to have fun. But I just care so much about this and it just is all I've ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I would write every day. Um, Thankfully, I a lot of my friends out there were also musicians, so we were all kind of in the same boat. As you were growing up, and yes. sort of like you were all into the same thing. Right, so we weren't all, I mean, of course, a few people wander, but, uh, you know, we're all trying to write every day and perform as much as we can. Mm -hmm. When you're gigging that much, I mean, you know, because you're, you're young still, but did you ever find it discouraging? You know, I read that it's like you play any venue and it was like three people here. Or you yes. just sort of take gigs. Are there times where you're like, ah, oh, this is kind of discouraging. Is something going to happen? Or do you are you kind of like, I'm just happy to be singing. Very happy to be singing. You know, it's, it's kind of a part of earning your stripes, I think. And uh, my goal whenever I played to three people was to hopefully make those three people feel inspired to write themselves. Um, or... Uh, you know, impact those three people to um, enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. So you do all that, and you're with Island Records, right? Yes. Now, we're always and interested... And Teleport Records. Okay, got to get them in there, Teleport yes, as well. Yes. Uh, it's We're always interested, I think, for any, like, other creative people listening to this pod, or, like, how that stuff happens. How do you come about getting a record deal? How, like, how, how do you make that leap for everybody else that's gigging right now and wants to make that leap? How does it happen for you? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with preparation, timing, and meeting interesting people. Uh, when I was playing all these random shows, I was singing at a songwriter's round, and um, my now manager uh, was actually at a guitar center, and he heard this vocalist singing. It was not me singing, but he went up to the vocalist, and he said, are you playing any shows? She was. She was playing a show um, that weekend um, at a songwriter's round. I was at that songwriter's round, mm. um, which I would have been anyways because I was taking any show I could. And um, it was actually my first songwriter's round that I've ever done. And um, I got coaxed into going first. And then he came up to me after. His name is George Robertson. And then a week later, I got introduced to... Mark Jackson and Ian Brendan Scott, and uh, who are producers, mm -hmm. and the first song we wrote together was River. And so within a matter of eight days, you know, my whole life had been changed. And that was a mix of preparation, um, you know. Meeting opportunity. Right. So, you know, you're in this pool of a bunch of people that are performing every day and doing these things, and then you meet this manager. Yes. And then you meet these producers. Were you going into a co-write? Had you done a lot of co-writing before? I had done co-writing before, uh, but this was definitely a different experience because they produce as well. Yeah. 
it was kind of like ending with a finished product. You know, I had done personal writing and I had done co-writing, but it always ended with you know, this obscure voice memo, which are the best. So I, it's I, like here, but it's not. Totally. It, it was an obscure voice memo. There was some piano, there was chords going on, mm -hmm. maybe someone like, you know, doing some drum thing. Uh, but to kind of uh, sing the song and have a finished product was a whole new world for me. Mm -hmm. Are you precious about co-writing? Like, is it, is it important for you to get your idea pushed through or are you open to collaboration in every form? I'm truly open to collaboration. Uh, if I am not wanting to do that, I probably wouldn't enter into a co-write situation. Uh, I kind of think that is the joy that comes with co-writing is that you get influenced by everyone in the room. And, uh, there are some moments where I will have an idea and I may have to convince, <laughs> you know, I may feel very passionately, uh, but I am always open to everyone and, um, and, and in turn, you know, I hope they're open to me. And River's the song that came out of that session. Yes. That was the first song we wrote together. Is that what led to the record deal? Uh, I think what led to uh, that whole thing was uh, we got this placement, um, this Acura placement, mm -hmm. and it was for our song Wild Horses. And uh, that brought a lot of um, unique people in our little studio that was in my producer's mother-in-law's house. Mm. Um, and uh, maybe it was people that wouldn't have come in the door before. So I think that opened a lot of doors for us as well. Well, for, I mean, and this is always an interesting thing for creatives. It's like you sort of, you know, you make your music and it comes from your place, but there's also sort of an aspect of your life that needs to be maybe cognizant of being a career. It's like, oh, I want a, a, a major label deal because it might lead to this or this opportunity, which gets lets me do what I want to do full time. Right. When you're making the decision to sort of like sign with a label or take that next step, is that a difficult thing for you? Is that something that you really have to think hard about or are you just like, let's just keep it moving? I think it all depends on who it's with. Uh, I think when you know, you know, and uh, with Island and Teleport um, collaborating, it was it just felt right. Mm -hmm. Is that like about the people that maybe are representing those companies? It's like yes. I like the relationships here, and I feel good about this. Yeah, it was honestly a mix. I mean, uh, I think you know after meeting. Um, a whole different array of characters. Um, I thought it was very similar to dating um, in the sense <laughs> that, you know when you meet someone and they've maybe not even said anything to you and you're like, you're a psycho. Like you just, you, you just know, you just, and, and you can't explain. It's like <laughs> their track record's great. They've gone on dates with, you know, this person and this person or whatever. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, and I think that's the one thing that I hope I always hold on to, which is just if you have the inner peace in your soul, you can make any decision because all the answers are within yourself. But some of them are harder to listen to than others. What would be an example of something that's a hard decision to listen to? Ooh, uh, I would say because this is such a huge dream of mine, I think something that was always hard was uh, knowing that you deserve better even when you have nothing. Hmm. So expecting something even when you have no reason to. And uh, what I mean by that is specifically just people I worked with. And in the past, I had terrible experiences with um, either other songwriters or producers. Um, and uh, they're definitely not worth mentioning, but uh, it was one of those things that I had nothing, but I knew it wasn't right. And that was a hard decision because I wanted it so badly and I wanted that the dream that they were selling me, but I just knew it wasn't right. Uh, so I think that has been something I've tried to keep doing. To walk away from potential opportunities if it doesn't jive with how you're feeling. Yeah, and if, it, uh, if it's not good people. Yeah. I think that, that tells you a lot and um, Sometimes this doesn't mean as much to other people as it does to you. You know, for them, it's just another project. It's a job. It's a job. 
Uh, they could be a bank teller. Exactly. They're just putting in their hours. Right. But for you, it's your life. But for me, it's literally, it's, it's the biggest passion that I've ever had. And it's all I've ever wanted. So, uh, yeah, I think that was a very hard decision along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that happened a lot. You have to make those decisions a lot. Have you ever second-guessed one of those decisions? Uh, never. Oh. <laughs> That's a pretty good track record. Yeah. <laughs> um, you recently did Fallon. Insane. Yeah. I mean, you, I, it's so funny with these podcasts because you can't see my face, but I just, went, <laughs> I just made a huge smile. Um, yeah, that was so surreal. There was a lot of tears going on, uh, you know, afterwards, obviously. Of course, yeah. Just I mean, like happy tears. like. Yes. And before, I mean, I would have been crying before, but A, makeup. <laughs> okay. Um, you know so much about that, of course. Yeah. Um, and then B, uh, it was the fact that uh, I had to, you know, perform one of my most aggressive songs, and I wanted it to be genuine, and uh, so I just had to take myself out of where I was, um, and yeah, I don't know how I got in there, but very <laughs> thankful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so like, when you do a show like that, how does that look? So it's like, you get there, uh, do you meet Jimmy? So I, we met him uh, after the show. Um, we met him briefly on stage, um, I think, that interaction happened right after we played and I could see him at the side and he was jamming and like <laughs> banging his head which is so motivating and exciting um, and then he came by after the show uh, which was awesome like after the show was taped he came by yeah and he he held my manager's baby oh that's nice <laughs> and uh, did spit bubbles with the baby <laughs> uh, totally stole my moment you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> very, baby. very yeah. rude of the baby. Um, <laughs> but it's fine. Like, uh, we're like, well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're on good terms now. Okay, I cool. mean, he's four months. It's like, yeah. yeah. It's time for that relationship. There's to grow. time. Yeah. There's time. Um, but yeah, it was very, very exciting. How long sound check? Like, do you just get one run through and that's it? And the middle sound of the day? check, actually, the staff was amazing. It, it honestly went by super quick, but I think we did a couple of run throughs. Uh, you know, the band normally has their moment to set up and then I perform it a couple of times, but it was my first time ever performing to cameras and, you know, it was a whole new world. There's lights, of course. you know, yeah. Were you like, do I look directly into camera or do I sort of perform myself? Do I perform to the audience in the yes. room? So I asked this, uh, to the camera guy, um, shout out to Greg <laughs> and he, <laughs> <It's a night> <laughs> <show>? <laughs> yes. Okay. And he told me that, uh, it's always best because they cut it, you know, they have all these different cameras. Sure. It's always best to perform to the crowd and to really pretend that it's a real show, which it is, of course, it's a real show, it's live. But, uh, you know, because it's this TV environment, there's a part of you that is like, should I perform to this camera? Should I be doing something different? But the minute he said that, I was like, I the only way this will come across as authentically as myself is to perform it the way I would any other show. Mm -hmm. And that's to the audience. And uh, I think and I hope they were receptive. Yeah, talking to um, some other musicians, they say the hardest things about these gigs. Like we just had a big award show here called the MMPAs. And yes, we were talking I to a bunch of yeah, performers that were coming off stage. And they were saying the hardest thing about those sort of like one song gigs is going like a zero to a hundred. Like that to try and get into like, you know, gig mode. Right. And it's like you have to ramp it up and then you're down all of a sudden instead of maybe performing a full show. Right. Did but you find it hard to get to that, that spot or did you were able to just turn it on? That's my favorite challenge. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, I'm someone that before I go on stage, I'm this meditating angel. And then the minute I get on stage, um, I kind of go into the side of me that most people don't see. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot darker and maybe less appealing uh and uh so i i find it fun i find it fun to have that challenge of um going zero to 100 and uh making the best of it yeah yeah um you know right now you have singles out you're yes. doing all this press it feels like things are blowing up for you hope so <laughs> fingers crossed fingers um crossed. Yeah, like, do you have, like, an LP in the works? What's the what's the plan going forward? Well, if you come to one of our shows, which you should, um, it was, uh, basically, the whole set is new material. Okay. Um, that is unreleased. 
So the people that have been coming to the shows have been kind of getting this inside look to what maybe something future would look like. But just know we always have something up our sleeves and uh, we always have something in the works. Do you feel like this is, I mean, it's always that thing where people like, do you feel like this is all happening really fast or do you feel like I've been doing this for decades now since I was a little kid? Uh, it depends on the day. Okay. Yeah, I I think there have been really great lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, I just turned 24. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you. What, what's the actual birthday? It's July 18th. Oh, exciting. Yes. All right, cool. Um, and with those 24 years of, you know, and I, I would honestly say it's been my whole life um, wanting this and trying to have tunnel vision, um, I... I really think that this is, I lost my train of thought. What were they saying? Uh, I was asking about, <laughs> does it feel like it's happening really fast? And oh, okay. You said, yeah, it wait, no, on the okay, day. that's the perfect answer. Okay, <laughs> totally. Okay, wait, that is, the, so what just happened is the perfect answer because it truly, it's like I can't even take it in. That is the perfect answer. Yeah. I can't even take it in because uh, it is happening very fast, but yes, depending on the day, some days it feels, um, you know, like I'm really taking in the lessons that I've learned along the way. Uh, and I'm going to lose my train of thought again, so let's just go on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> I literally was like, are you really going to veer off again? I just, I, yeah, it's just, we're all in. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I guess I was just going to ask, you know, like, w what you do have planned for the future is just more gigging, releasing an album at some point with this new material you're talking about? Yeah, we um, we have some really cool shows coming up. We're doing, um, we're opening for Coldplay. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask about. I didn't even have that much. That's amazing. So it's like, how does that go? I think it's nine dates. I yeah, saw. it's nine dates. How does that come about? And holy shit, Coldplay, right? Like, I mean. Madness. I mean, that's going to be happening, I think it's either in a week and a half or two weeks from now. Uh, and I definitely didn't sleep the minute I found out. I mean, I haven't slept since. That's why I'm clearly losing my mind and losing my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, well, basically we were in the studio uh, writing. And my manager came in and he sat us down. He was like, I have some news for you. Um, seemed like a funeral was about to occur. You know, he seemed very serious. Wow. And then he surprised us. He and did the old switcheroo. Exactly. And uh, I just, I wish there was footage of it, but none of us knew what was happening. Uh, but we were just in stunned silence. Uh, and... I think all of us were just shocked and uh, it's so early, you know, for, for us to be given an opportunity like that from someone that made such a huge impact, I mean, the impact in the alternative space uh, was a big deal. Have a favorite Coldplay song? Oh, I love Fix You. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of tears streaming down your face. I know. You know. Totally. Yes. Um, well, yeah. Good luck with everything in the future. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, this is everyone's favorite part of the episode, the dessert, but this is a dessert unlike any other because we have our friend, our dear friend, Matt Unsworth here filling in for Max. Shane, how do you feel about that? Oh, well, as always, anytime we're in the weird setup in this mini booth, I feel <laughs> totally weird. <laughs> but I am glad uh, Unsworth is here as we, it's been like a year since I think we've seen him. It's been a while. I think, oh, the, well, the pub crawl. The, wait, no, the bachelor party. Oh yeah, you were, yeah, he was in the with us. Remember I was there? Oh, yeah, I forgot about yeah, that. There was so many guys. Shane on that had a good time party. on the bachelor party. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, before that, when you came down to LA, we went to the comedy store and stuff. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why was I there? Uh, it was You're that shooting gaming, with Myers. online gaming thing. Oh yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that on the yeah. pod. <laughs> oh yeah, the online gaming thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, but, anyways, it's been a while. Yeah. And now you're back for a quick little uh, stint. We were just saying how we're excited that after we record this, we're going for drinks. Oh, we are. And speaking of which, I was wondering if you guys wanted to go to the Kanye show tonight. Wow, really? It that could a possibility? be possibility. Yeah, it's uh, the nut <laughs> supplied it, so really? it could be us three and Myers. Go. It could be like a pre-drink. Huh? Wow. That's a, wow. This is like you're here for anyone at home that can't see us. Uh, Unzi and I are like shocked right now uh, that this is on the table. Okay, wow. well, well shit, yeah. let's get through this, and then uh, and then we'll talk about maybe seeing Kanye, and then we'll have something to talk about in the next pod. Well, yeah, that's crazy. Because apparently back. the show's 
nuts. No in pun intended. Stage. Yeah. <laughs> he plays on a floating stage, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first of all, guys, Shane just got married. It was an a, amazing wedding, and we'll probably get more into that in another pod because Max wasn't actually at the wedding, so maybe mm-hmm. you can describe that more. But you also, and this comes with most weddings, had a honeymoon. I did, yes. I went to St. Martin. Saint Wait, Martin. Saint. Well, you can. I think you can say it two ways. Like Saint. People often correct me when I say Saint. They go Saint Martin or, or Saint Martin, but it's Dutch and French. So I think depending where you are, they say it different. And the the two sides of the island I noticed are very different too. Just in the behavior, there's one side where you can li- like drink and drive. It's not illegal. Like and the 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 French, which is the Dutch side, and the French side. You can't drink at all, hardly. You'll get busted, cops everywhere, trying to bust tourists, everything. But you can be naked, and no one's naked <laughs> on the Dutch side. Everyone's naked on the It'd French side. It'd be such a better time if they could all just come together. Meld it all. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a big naked drink and drive and party fest. You constantly need to remember which side you're on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a ticket for driving naked and drunk. I mixed it. No, I didn't. But... Uh, <laughs> But what did happen is I went on a um, a nude beach. I actually geared down. I, it was funny because my whole plan was I'm not going to see anyone I know, <laughs> so I'm just going to get naked. Like your penis I'm is gonna out, get, and I haven't shaved my pubes. Anything. <laughs> it's like horrible. Did you do the hover hand in front of it, or you just fall like walking no. like you had pants on? Well, the plan was to just be confident and right. have uh, my dinky out. But I get on the plane. And Liz Trenier is there. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of other people from our work are on the plane <laughs> to my honeymoon. <laughs> Completely random. So I'm having a panic attack because I promised my wife now that I would be naked the trip because that's something she's proud to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but luckily it was a uh, – I had to do a layover, so it, they were just going to the Pittsburgh part. Oh, and then you connected in Pittsburgh. Yes, but I was panicking, checking their Instagrams, and making sure that they were definitely in Pittsburgh before I disrobed. <laughs> <laughs> but any, anyway, I get to the, um, the beach, and I thought getting naked or whatever was very, uh, like, kind of hippie-ish. I didn't think uh, people consider it a sexual thing at all. And sure enough, when we got there, there was a bunch of nude people helping a baby turtle. Okay. Like the survival rate for baby turtles is very low. Like they lay all these eggs, but these they were helping this turtle and this everything. It's a very cultural trip. You're telling yeah. me about the Dutch side, the French side, baby turtles. Yeah, but uh, and then we went over and we kind of like like played with the turtle, and then we look over and there's a gangbang going on the beach <laughs> no just to the left of us. Yeah, like a turtle gangbang or no, human gangbang. Humans like this this guy is just what like like. Right in there like crazy. So there's sex happening on this beach. Sex? Sex on the beach. It's crazy. Uh, And we're just watching it. And then we're like, these people are probably hammered or know each other for years. We watch it the whole time. (laughs) And then at the end of it, they just hug and they say, nice to meet you. And they separate. (laughs) They just met. How many people were in there? Four. Four people. Yeah, like an an older couple, a guy our age, and a girl our age. Wow. So that was an interesting part. Uh, Were you thought. nude watching this at this point? I was nude watching. Did it you was, become aroused? It, I was aroused only because uh, I was getting kind of caressed under the water. But <laughs> me, by the baby turtle? <laughs> yes. Why are you nibbling me, baby? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Snapping turtle! <laughs> so that was an interesting thing that happened. That was the first like, really fascinating thing that happened. This definitely happened on the French side. Uh, yes, okay. French side. So then uh, we're walking along the Dutch side, and this, like, very boisterous Dutch man comes up. He's like, he's like, are you over 30? I won't do the Dutch accent. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> he's like, are you over 30? I'm like, yes. He's like, you're eligible to win a prize. So obviously I'm thinking this is a huge scam. So he scratches the – I scratch the ticket that he gives me, and I win a free drink. So I'm like, okay, that, that's fine. He's like, okay, even though she, my wife, is under 30, I'll give her a ticket. Gives her a ticket. She wins the grand jackpot. And Alex, ju- or my wife, just goes nuts. Like, she's totally never been scammed before, never fallen for anything, <laughs> so believes it. And everyone's cheering. He's like, you just won $1,000, a trip to St. Martin, or an iPod, or an, an iPad. 
And he's like, all you have to do is listen to a little presentation. So obviously it's a timeshare scam. <laughs> <laughs> but Alex is so excited. I explained to her that it's definitely a scam of sorts. But we still agree. To sit through this pitch. To sit through it because we're going to still get it, presumably. The iPad. One, one of the prizes. Right. Which, what do you think it would be? You think? Would I think they probably had iPads there. That's what we, that was our... Like, they're not going to give you a grand. I feel like first generation (laughs) iPad. (laughs) Exactly. Furbished. (laughs) Yeah. And then, so we go, just like, I'm sheerly curious about this, and I think it'll be a funny thing to talk about, at the very least on the pod, if all goes wrong. So we we get there. That same four people are having a a, (laughs) (laughs) fun presentation. (laughs) They do everything. (laughs) Um, So we get a free drink, and we're introduced to the woman who's the saleswoman. And uh, she doesn't want to leave the bar. She just wants to chat, get to know us, get all this information, wants to know how much we make a year, all this stuff. But it's all under the guise of we're buddies. And then Alex is like, when's the presentation start? She goes, I'm sick of my office. Let, let's just hang out in here and chat and all this. Showing us, I don't know what that accent is either. <laughs> she was French. French she Dutch, was, right? yeah, she, no, she was French. She wasn't Caribbean or anything like that. So, and Alex like, no, let's just get to the presentation. So we go to the office and she just starts talking more small chat. So I'm like, this is never going to end. This 90 minute pre- presentation probably hasn't even started yet. Anyway, we get the presentation started. And then I reveal to her that we're just there for the prize. I'm like, listen, like the prize is so good. We're clearly just here for that. And then she turned on us. She just started insulting me and saying (laughs) I wasn't buying the timeshare because I probably have other girlfriends (gasps) and I want a vacation with them. So she knows you. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> how did she, how did she, she know knows my checkered past. She must have known one of my other past girlfriends. <laughs> but then uh, she said that. Yeah, she said that, and then are you laughing through this? Like, cause well, I'm being kind of funny. Like, I, I made a joke, like, like kind of what you just said, referencing right. the past girlfriends and all that. And then she, I'm like, listen, this is my honeymoon. I just bought a house. I just got married. Literally, this is our second day being married. (laughs) If I come home with a timeshare and tell her father I did that, the wedding's over. Like, the marriage is the shortest we can get an omen. And she's like, you tell her father everything you two do? I'm like, not the sex stuff. No. But if it's about buying a property, then yes. And furthermore, I don't get to keep this property. I only get it for 99 years, so I can't even pass this on to my kids. Like, you don't get the property. She gets very mad. Very insulting. Then she goes, well, now we have to sit through a computer presentation. I'm like, no, I'm not getting it. She's, and she just sits there and stares at us. <laughs> and no one says anything. And we just look at each other for a minute and a half. And I just go, Alex, you want another drink? Because I'm going to buy drinks. Then she starts panicking, like, oh, these people are just going to drink their way through the presentation. Obviously, her plan is for us to get so insulted that we leave without the prize. Oh, I see. She calls the manager in. The manager had a more normal disposition. We explained it to her what was going on. Begrudgingly, they gave us the prize, which was another trip back to St. Martin. Whoa! Yes. That's crazy. But, like, I I researched, obviously, the scam. So many people have been scammed. What they do when they get you back, they try to harass you even more. But you just got to kind of take it jokey, and you can make your way through it. Would you sit through another timeshare presentation just for your free trip? It's fascinating. Like, you would love it, Mike, just as a point of, like, if you don't get mad, if you know the scam, I wasn't even mad at the woman after I looked up the scam, because they purposely get mad, and she probably felt like an idiot, too, because we're joking people, but no, the average person would definitely walk out, because they try a bunch of insulting tactics. <laughs> Luckily, it turns into a roast when they can't <laughs> say the time but, Okay, so that was another, that was an interesting thing that happened kind of out of the ordinary, it never really been through that. Let's go to Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all. That's our episode. I want to thank Matt Unsworth for coming in all the way from LA. Thanks for coming on, Matt. Thanks for having me. Shaney boy. Always, as always. good to be here. Yep. Uh, the Mike on Much podcast is produced by Max Kerman. I'm your host, Mike Veerman. Follow us at Mike on Much on Instagram, on Twitter. All the dudes are done by Jenna Gregory, jennasdoodles.com. See you next week if we don't die in the weekend. Bye.